All right, so, so today I'm uh, going to finish with two things. So they will be really part three and four are really about uh, different topics. So, so part three, I'm going to talk about some, some applications um, <clears throat> about the Vlasov equation on a fixed black hole background. So I'm going to neglect the self-gravity completely of the gas. So I'm going to assume in both cases, I'm going to discuss that the gravity is completely dominated by the black hole. Also, I'm going to assume that it's that we have a non-rotating black hole is to make the calculations uh, uh, simpler, basically. But in principle, one could do the same with the with the Kerr black hole. Uh, and I'm going to so in this part, so in part four, I'm going then, then we are going to kind of continue the course I started, which was like this pedagogical introduction to the relativistic Boltzmann equation. And there's, of course, one very important ingredient that was missing in my last lecture was, and this was a collision term. Okay, so in the fourth part, that's what we're going to do. We're going to resume like the, uh, the more theoretical part of the course, I mean, of the, of the theory and derive the, and I'm going to present you a, a derivation of the collision term, which uh, probably is not found in, in, I mean, which is not the usual thing that you found in books. All right, but in this part, so, uh, so, so, so two, uh, two things. So, so, so the first thing is about dynamics. So the idea is, well, how should the, the distribution function look like? Okay. and. I mean, originally the distribution function depends on seven variables. So the time variables and six uh, space variables and the six, uh, so sorry, the three momentum variables if you're on the mass shell. Um, so that's a lot of freedom, but as I'm going to show you that in some cases you can, um, you, you, you can assume that somehow the gas will relax, so we'll get in a kind of stationary state, and then that actually out of these seven variables, so you, you end up with a distribution function of three variables. So that's, that's somehow great because it's a great simplification. I mean, the degree of freedom is, is um, drastically <clears throat> reduced, and that's uh, due to a, relaxa a relaxation process, which is very interesting, I, I found because there are no collisions. So, so we are still talking about Vlasov equations. So there is no H theorem or something like that that drives somehow the gas to thermal equilibrium. That's what you're going to look at in the fourth part of this talk. But in, in this part here, there are no collisions at all. So what drives the gas to, to equilibrium? Okay, and this is the mixing phenomena, uh, which has been discussed in many other contexts that I'm going to, that I went to discuss here. Okay, in the second part, then I'm going to show you some examples of these final states, um, which are um, station axisymmetric tori. These are not the, the unique solutions, there are many solutions, but I'm going to show you a specific model, and that's still without self gravity. Okay, so, uh, so, so people here numerically uh, have done much more sophisticated things, but, but here there's no self-gravity. But again, if you can assume that the, the gravity is completely dominated by the central black hole, then these solutions probably make, make sense or interesting. All right. So how do you solve the Vlasov equation on a curved background? So in general, that's not completely trivial because, I mean, the you, you, you have this if you remember, you have this term that involves the Christoffel symbol, so the derivatives of the metric in, in the equations. But um, uh, so, so there is a, a very nice tool that, that Marcus also in his talk was, was using, all these action angle variables, which here we'll call action angle type variables because we are in GR, not, not in Newtonian theory. Uh, but basically the idea is, and what I'm going to, to show you now is that, the, or remind you is about, is that the geodesic flow on a Schwarzschild background forms a completely integral Hamiltonian system. Okay, so you can, so, so, so you, you can solve basically the, the, not only one geodesics, but actually the whole flow. Okay, and that's, that's very nice. If you can solve for the flow, then you can solve also the, 
the, the Vlasov equation. And how does this happen? So, so the, the idea is to in, introduce new coordinates on the cotangent space, uh, which are symplectic. So that means they, they preserve the form of the um, symplectic structure. So which was, if you remember, dp mu dx mu. So, so we are looking at the uncharged case, just to clarify. So it's, it's a simple gas, massive particles, identical particles, and there is no charge. So this, this was a symplectic structure. And now these new coordinates, they have the, the q mu, j mu, they have the property that omega s still has this form. So the Hamiltonian equation of motions, they are, they are still the same in, in these variables. But now, uh, as we're going to see, the, the, the Hamiltonian is, is much simpler now in these new variables. Okay, so that's the, that's the trick. And well, in general, of course, it's it's not not very difficult. I mean, how should I find them? But uh, you can uh, actually the the action variables j mu. We're going to see you can define them quite naturally in terms of topological invariance and taking into account the mass shell condition. And the angle variables then they are obtained through a generating function, like similarly to to the to what Mark was presenting in his course. Okay, and as I said before, so the what we'll see is is that by by construction, uh, the Hamiltonian in these new coordinates will just be minus one half j zero squared. So you see from this that g zero is is in basically the mass. Okay, okay uh, tells you what is the what is the mass if the momentum is the the, the mass. I mean p squared basically or square root of p squared if you want. Okay, and now that's the, the first exercise. As I'm sure you already solved all the other exercises, so you're bored. So, so this is but this is an easy exercise. So show that the Liouville vector field now, uh, when restricted to the future mass shell, uh, is has this form. If the Hamilton has this form, okay, knowing that these are symplectic coordinates. Okay, so this is a, a, um, a simple calculation if you understood what I told you, if you learned what I told you two, two days ago. Okay, so, so you see that's very nice because the Liouville vector field now basically tells you it's just a derivative along Q0. So it's just a directional derivative. Uh, and now it's very easy to solve the Liouville equation. The Liouville equation or the Vlasov equation, remember, was that L of F should be zero. Now if L has this form, that means that F is a function of all the remaining variables. Okay, so, so we are on the mass shell, so the mass is fixed. So it's Q1, Q2, Q3, J1, J2, J3. Okay, for a suitable uh, function F. And suitable here means in particular, so we're going to see that Q1, Q2, Q3 are really angle variables, so they're two pi periodic. So F should be two pi periodic in the first three entries. All right, so. How, how, how do we find this uh, magic coordinates? And uh, so for definiteness, let us work with standard Schwarzschild coordinates. Uh, all for the things I'm going to define are not really dependent on what coordinates you, you, you introduce. Uh, now, what integrals of motions do you have for the Jessic flow in the Schwarzschild spacetime? Um, so first of all, you have the Hamiltonian itself. Okay. so the it corresponds to the conserved quantity, which is minus the mass squared half. You have two killing vector fields, so, so d by dt and d by d phi. So phi is the, the asymptotal killing vector field and t the asymptotically time-like killing vector field. So, so if you dot this with p, then you get two conserved quantities. So this is just energy and asymptotal angular momentum. And then you have the total angular momentum as well. Of course, you have the other components of the angular momentum as well, but we will only use these four for the moment. Okay, and what you can show, that's the, um, well, it should be an exercise, but, but you, you can check easily that all these four quantities, a Poisson commute with each other. Okay, so you take, for example, the Poisson commute of H with E with epsilon, that's, that's zero. I mean, that just means that E is conserved along the flow of H. Okay, but you can also check, for example, that E and LZ, they, they commute, uh, Poisson commute between each other. Okay, it's very simple. Just you can use, for example, the adapted uh, local coordinates associated with the usual Schwarzschild coordinates, and then it's a, it's a very easy exercise. 
You can also show that the differential of these quantities, they are linearly independent almost at every point. Uh, the exceptional points that we will soon understand why they correspond to circular or equatorial orbits. So we'll see later why that happens. But aside from these points, uh, the differential of these quantities, they are linearly independent. Okay. Now, equatorial orbits, for example, it's easy to understand why, because in this case, you have the de degeneracy, okay? And so, so for equatorial orbits, L squared is LZ squared. So there are no A, there's no X and Y component angular momentum. So, so these are really not, not independent. All right. Now, the next step is you define, you introduce these invariant sets. So you look at the points XP in the future mass shell in phase space, for, for which this quantity epsilon is E, LZ is LZ, and L squared is, is this, uh, L squared. Okay, so you give four numbers here, M, E, L, Z, and L, and this gives you like a subset of the of phase space, okay? And the union of all these, of course, spans the phase space. Um, and by definition, these are invariants under the flow, the Hamiltonian flow generated by this for integrals of motion. Okay, that's just because of the, 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 property, the, Hamil the property of the Hamiltonian vector field that, that we have seen. And if non-empty, they describe smooth four-dimensional submanifolds, okay, away from the exceptional points. That's because of, of what I told you before, that the differential of these quantities are linearly independent. Okay, so, so almost everywhere, say for almost all these values, um, well, uh, uh, yeah, for, the, 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 these are basically four, you can think of this as four dimensional submanifolds of the future mass shell. Okay, and now the, the, um, the, the first result is here that, that, that what you can show. So this, these are again standard tools from classical mechanics that you can find Arnold's book, for example. Uh, you, you can show that now if you restrict the symplectic form to, to these subsets, to these submanifolds, this, uh, this is zero. This restriction is zero, okay? And the proof is, is very simple because you know that these four vector fields, they are tangent, okay? But you also know they are linearly independent and then this four dimensional, so they must span the, at, at, at every point, they must span the tangent space. But on the other hand, if you compute the, the symplectic forms we evaluate on two of these vectors, by definition, this is a Poisson bracket, which is zero. Okay, so, so any vector, which is a linear combination of this one, will satisfy the same property by, by linearity. Okay, so, so that, that's a proof. An important consequence of this uh, proposition is as, uh, remember the Poincaré one form, so the differential of the Poincaré form, Poincaré one form was the symplectic form. That's how we defined it. So, so, so the consequence of this is that this is closed when restricted to, to the submanifolds. Okay, so we're going to use this in a little moment. Now, how do these uh, submanifolds or this invariant set look like? Um, well, you, you, you can write down just well, what it means. So if XP is in this set, then that means that, remember we use Schwarzschild coordinates, so PT is minus E. D phi is LZ, and now this is just a definition of the total angular momentum where instead of P phi squared, I put LZ squared here. And this is the equation you get from just writing down explicitly what is H is minus M squared half. And you reshuffle this a little bit, and then you get this equation here, this relation between PR and R. So VLM here is the effective potential, you, you recognize it. So N is one minus two M over R. And this is a little m is the mass of the particles plus L squared over R squared. So this is the effective potential. And now you see that this splits into four, four different, so, so you have a, in four different groups, right? You have this T P T, the phi P phi, theta P theta, and R P R. So the motion splits into these four different components. And now you see from here, T is completely free. So that gives you an R. Uh, factor if you want. Phi is completely free while P phi is fixed. So that gives you an S1, a loop. Now theta P theta 
here, if LZ is smaller than L, then you can just by looking at, at these sets. So, so this is theta P theta, the phase space. These are just circular, I mean, these are just orbits, closed orbits. Okay, so topologically, this is also another S1. And now this equation, you, you have to look at the effective potential. And, and then you, you know from your course, I mean, from, from the Schwarzschild geodesics. So, so if L is larger than some critical value, then this has actually a, a, potent, there's a potential well. So here is R, R dots. So, so it looks so, so here are the, these uh, bound orbits. And these are the ones that we are going to focus on now. So there are also unbound orbits here, but those we are not going to, to consider. So we're going to assume that each gas particle moves on a bound orbit. And this point here corresponds to the local maximum of the, of the potential. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so so but but these are the trajectories that we're going to focus on here. All right, so uh, and and now, so that gives you some restriction about E and L, so about the energy and the angular momentum, and and this you need to understand. So, uh, so this is the log of L and and uh, and the energy basically. So energy equal one in this unit. It, it means that it's asymptotically it's equal to. <clears throat> To, uh, to 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 m squared. So 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 if if they have energy above this, they will just uh, go to infinity. So the energy has to be smaller than one. But then also, the minimum energy that you can have for Schwarzschild, which is at the innermost tail circular orbit, is square root of eight divided by three m. So so that's uh, the point here. And then. Uh, if L and E is inside this domain D, then you have a, you, you get a, a bound orbit in the exterior region. Okay, so it looks something like this, the domain in this. So, so this boundary here, this corresponds to circular orbits. So that's given some value of L. These are the orbits with the minimum energy of fixed L. This blue curve here corresponds to what is called the ESO orbit or the innermost stable orbits. So, so those are the the orbits that, that have energy smaller than, than one, but the, the, the angular momentum is, is uh, small enough so that you have the, the potential maxima, which is the, the, the maxima is smaller than one. Uh, and this here are highly eccentric orbits. Okay, and everything that is inside this domain. So this, this characterizes um, um, uh, uh, bound orbits. In the exterior of, of Schwarzschild. Okay, so this is the region we're going to be interested in. Now, from what I, I said, so if LZ is different from L and epsilon and lambda is in this set, then these invariant submanifolds, they are topologically R cross T3. Okay, so you have the, the T factor gives you an R, I mean, the, the T gives you an R factor, and in, they are similar to phi gives you a loop. In RPR, you have a loop. In theta p, theta another loop. So, so it looks like this. So you can think of it like, like this. So you have a torus here, and then this direction that comes from from the time. Okay. So in in this formulation, so it's different than just classical mechanics because they're non-compact. You see, they're non-compact because of this time direction. So you would have to reduce it uh, to 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 choose a foliation or something like that to get compact. Um, uh, submanifolds, so they are non-compact. All right, so now how do you define the action variables? So the action variables you can now define in a very nice geometric way. So you take uh, loops that are winding around the, the free torus and that are contractible in with respect to every S1 except one. So you have, for example, this blue curve, or you can take this red curve. Okay, and for so you have three such curves here, and and for each of this one, you you define so you integrate this over the Poincaré one form. I remember I told you before that the Poincaré form is closed on these sets, so this really doesn't depend on the choice of the curve. So you can deform the curve, and the, the value here gives you the same. Okay, and if you compute this explicitly for for Schwarzschild, then J one is just the integral of a p phi d phi. So this is going, going around the asymptotal direction. So you have the asymptotal component of the angular momentum. If you compute J2, you have this integral here, 
which is L minus, if you can compute this explicitly, this, it gives you this here. But usually this is replaced. You can do this with another uh, symplectic transformation. You can change this to L just for simplicity. So we had J2, we are going to actually define as, as L. And J3 then is this integral over PR dr over the constant energy orbits in the RPR phase space. And this is given by, by this integral. Okay, now we need a fourth uh, <clears throat> action variable. And here the choice is, is not unique, and that's related to the fact that this is not non-compact. But um, there's one nice choice, or we think is, is nice at least, is if you, if you choose this square root of minus 2h. I mean, it's nice at least as, as long as you, you, the mass is positive, right? So, so this incorporates, if you want, the, 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 the constant, I mean, the mass shell condition. This is compatible with the mass shell condition. All right. And now the, the angle variables we can construct through the generating function. And the, and the generating function uh, is actually, you can also construct in a quite geometric way. So what you do, you, so it's a function of x and j, if you remember. Um, so these are the action variables that we have already defined. And uh, how, how, is, how, how does this work? So you give an x, so that's a, a point on the, on the manifold. So you look at the fiber and you intersect the fiber with uh, this invariant set. So that might give you no solution, one solution or more than one solution, but, but then you, you connect a given reference point on this with this point. And again, because of the property of theta, you can deform this curve and the, the value will not change, okay? It will change if you wind around. I mean, it does depend on another winding number or something like that. Uh, but uh, otherwise, it is, this is well-defined. Okay, so now if you work this out for Schwarzschild, then you get this expression. And now you, you have to, uh, I think I didn't write it down, but you have to, so the Q variables are obtained by differentiating S with respect to J. And well, if you, if you do that, you get uh, complicated expressions, but they are written down in, in our paper with, with uh, Paola. Um, in the last paper with Paula, but, but the structure more or less is the following. So, so, so Q0 we are not interested in because, I mean, the distribution function is independent of Q0. So I just wrote Q1, Q2, and Q3. So Q1 is a function, little Q1, that depends only on R, E, and L minus, and then you have a frequency times time, the time coordinates. Q2 has a similar structure, but it depends also on theta and LZ. And this is another frequency here, omega 2, depending on E and L times T. And Q3 has this structure here. So, so it's just a function of theta, phi, E, L, and LZ. And actually, this function you can, so the phi enters very simply. So it's just phi plus something that is, depends on theta, E, L, and LZ. And so you have these three frequencies, omega 1, omega 2, omega 3 is 0. That's related, I mean, that's a consequence of spherical symmetry. And omega one basically measures the frequency in the radial, or the radial motion. And omega two is the frequency uh, in the orbital motion. Okay, so, you, I mean, you had closed, closed orbits, for example, if these two are the same, or that uh, the ratio is, is uh, rational or something like that. Okay, so now we have these coordinates. And, and this you can compute explicitly uh, in principle. So, uh, and then now we, we know the, the solution of the Vlasov equation describing a gas of bound particles in a Schwarzschild space time has any solution has this form. You can write it in this form. It's completely general. So, no symmetry assumptions on the distribution function. Uh, where, where capital F is any function, say L1 uh, of T3 cross R3. Okay, so this is the angle action or the action angle representation of the of the solution. And and you see that capital F, you see with T zero, then then this goes away, this goes away, this goes away. And then this is basically the the the, the representation of the initial date of the initial datum for for F in action angle variables. Okay, you, you can say also more, you can learn more from this. So this is uh, very nice, but you 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 can 
now this has a lot of nice consequences. So, so first of all, you can say, for example, that F is axisymmetric. So you see, I mean, there is a more nicer argument based on symmetry vector fields and so on, but, but basically you see uh, phi enters only in Q3 here, okay? And, and, and that's the result actually, if you analyze this carefully, so you can check that F is axisymmetric if and only F is independent of Q3. So if this dependency goes away, you can also check that it's spherically symmetric uh, if and only it's independent of Q2 and Q3 and LZ. So here, everything that depends on theta and phi goes away. So, but it could depend on Q1, L and E. So that would be the, the spherically symmetric case. All right. Um, okay. So now we're going to ask a question, well, what happens when T goes to infinity? Okay, does this have a limit? If you just look at this, you're going to say, no, no way, okay? Because this is, I mean, this is just oscillating around the S1 factor. So clearly this has no limit, at least no pointwise limit, okay? Now let, let me change, I mean, introduce a little bit of more compact notation. So omega is going to be the, uh, the subspace of R3, the open subspace of R3 where the action variables live, J. And so I'm going to rewrite this formula like this in a more compact form. So Q is now as three components, J has three components. You, you could do the same in any dimension from what I'm going to say now. And omega of J here, I'm going to assume for the following that it's a C2 function on omega. So that's a free the, the frequency function. So these are free frequencies um, and they depend on the action variables. Okay. Okay, now let, let's, okay. So we already concluded that. Obviously this limit doesn't exist in the, in the <clears throat> I mean, the pointwise sense, unless F is constant in Q, for example, okay. But now remember what I was telling you the other day. So, so there's the phase space world and then there's a space time world, okay? And we live on the space time world. So when we measure properties of the gas, typically we integrate over the momentum, over the momenta, right? Over the momentum. So, so, so really what we should look like is like, are more like what I'm going to call now macroscopic observables. Uh, and for the moment, this is defined in the following sense. So as I take a test function, say continuous and, and bounded over the phase space, and I smear this distribution function out with it. So, so in other words, I integrate the distribution function times phi over the the, the spatial part of the phase space for under Q and, and J. Okay, so that gives you a time dependent uh, uh, quantity. Okay, and what you can ask now if this converges in time. Okay, and, and the, the result is, is a yes, if, if the following condition satisfies. So, so if you can show that the, you, you take the frequency function, you compute its Jacobian, so that gives you a free times free matrix. And if you can show that the determinant, I mean, that this is invertible almost everywhere. So in other words, the set where the determinant of this is zero is a set of Lebesgue measure zero. Then you can show that for all these test functions, this will converge in time. But you can also say to what it will converge, it will converge to the angle average of F. Okay, so, so this, this F, this averaged F here is the, the integral of F over Q divided by two, two pi to the three, so the angle average of F. Okay, so it converges in other words to the same observable that you would obtain if you replaced the distribution function with its um, angle average. Okay. Um, Okay, so, so that's what I just said. So, so if, the, if this uh, the non-degeneracy condition is satisfied almost everywhere, then the macroscopic observables will relax in time, uh, although the distribution function itself does not converge pointwise, okay? Okay, and, and that's what I said in the introduction. So in this way, you see the degrees of, the number of degrees of freedom is greatly reduced. Now in this case, from six to three. 
Okay, so before going to the proof or mentioning you uh, how the proof works, uh, let me let me uh, let, let's look at a very simple toy model example. It's just for uh, illustrative purposes. So, so let's start with just the the, the one D harmonic oscillator. So this x squared plus p squared. So in this case, a symplectic form is just this one. Now you can compute the action variables, action angle variables. If you have never done this, uh, this could be another exercise. So, so, so here the um, the action variable is basically a square root of of the radius. If you if you write x p in the in, in a plane and and you and you give it polar coordinates and, and q is actually just the polar coordinate in this case, was related to the to the polar to the to the polar coordinates. Okay, now now if you write it in this in, in this way, so h is just e, and omega as you can check is d d h d q. And now of course the equation of motion are very simple here. They just say q dot is d h by d e, which is one here. So that's your frequency is constant one, and e is conserved. Okay, so. So, so what would happen? So here, the, the, this is a case where there's no mixing because the frequency is constant. So, so this is a phase space X and P. And here, imagine some initial data. So these are the contour level of the initial data. These are just some plots are generated with Maple. Now, you, you see this will just be a rigid motion, okay? Because every, so these are the trajectories and they all have the same angular velocity. So after some times we'll be here uh, and then here and so on. So this will rigid, so, so this initial data distribution will just rigidly rotate. Now what happens if we change this model a little bit? So we change Hamiltonian and instead of being x squared plus p squared, it's a nonlinear function of x squared plus p squared. So we add a small quadratic term here. So the symplectic form and the action angle variables are still the same, but now the Hamiltonian is a nonlinear function of E. Okay, so what changes now that the frequency depends on E. So in this case, it's one plus K times E, E is still conserved. So, so what happens now you see uh, is that if K is positive, so the, the larger the energy, the larger the, the, the speed. Okay, so if you start again with the same initial configuration, this will kind of spread spread out, okay, because these exterior things, they move faster. So it will kind of do something like this, no? And, and then if you wait longer, something like this, and this is actually the, the mixing, okay? The mixing phenomena, okay? So it's like when you were a kid and you, you, had, you went to, to these uh, parties and I don't know, yeah, chocolate or something, and then you mix it or something like this. Huh? Okay, so and now you, you, you see what happens. Now, if you, if you integrate here over some, some region then, and you wait long enough, then, then you see uh, this will just spread out over this region and then you will, have, you will see like an, an average of what's going on on the energy curves. So this is very similar to, to ergodicity, but it's a little bit a stronger condition than ergodicity. Okay, now to prove this, you, use, uh, you can use uh, Fourier methods and actually, uh, uh, this is something that you can read uh, uh, in, for, for example, in, in papers by, by Lyndon Bell in, uh, in Galactic Dynamics, an article about Galactic Dynamics 62, which is really very nice. And I, he, he has all the ideas. I mean, it's, it's uh, so, 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 um, uh, he, 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 I mean, he, he doesn't make the proof rigorous, but, but basically he, he has all the, the key ideas. And, and yeah, so one way of, I mean, there are different ways to Fourier transform it, but, but the, the, the most natural thing is to Fourier transform in the angle variables. So it is, again, exactly the same thing that Marcus did in, in, his, in his lecture. Uh, so you, you have this one here, and these are the Fourier coefficient. They depend on J. And now you use, you know, Parseval's identity uh, to rewrite this macroscopic observable in this way here. So HK here is the product of the Fourier of the Fourier coefficients, basically of f and and phi, the test function. Okay, so you have something of this form, and now the idea is you have here this oscillating factor here. So the idea, if you can show that you can put the limit below the sum, okay, and uh, and and then you see this this will as t goes to infinity, this will oscillate very fast. 
So this will average out to, to zero, except when it surely doesn't work is if k is zero, okay? If k is zero, then, then this is just constant. And, and then, so this term is not damped, but all the other ones, they were, are going to be averaged out. That's, that's a, the intuition. Okay, so only the k equals zero mode survive. And if this is true, then you only get the zero mode here that survives, but the zero mode is just, uh, uh, I mean, it's basically the angle average of the function. And then you finish, uh, you, you, yes, uh, and then that will give you the proof. Now to make this a little bit more, to make this rigorous, I mean, you, you need to, to check if this, is, if this really goes through. So, uh, you, you can do this in these following four steps, three steps, sorry. So, so first you show that your conditions are such that this HK is L1 and that it's the L1 norm over K is summable. So that, okay, so that will basically allow you to interchange the integral and the sum. Um, and that's actually okay if F is assumed to be, for example, continuous and with compact support in J. Okay, and then you apply this generalized riemann lebeck lemma, so, so that tells you if you have a, any L1 function and you have a function W, which is not the same as omega, so this W, which is C2, and the critical points form a zero measure set, then you can show that this goes to zero. So this is the averaging I was telling you about before. And then you apply this lemma to omega J, which in our case, K times omega of J. Okay, in the condition that the determinant should not be zero means that basically if this is a zero measure set, this will also be a zero measure set. And, and then you verify that this identity is actually true in a strict, not just formal sense. And then you have shown it if F is continuous and compact support in J, but then you can um, approximate F in L1 and then you, you, you can do a density argument and show the theorem. So that's the, the essence of the of the proof. Uh, recently, uh, there were some alternative proofs which are based on the vector, vector field method. So by Chaturvedi and Luke and Moreno, Rio Seco and Van den Bosch, and Paula who is here. Uh, and then they exploit the fact so that you can construct a vector field which commutes with the Liouville vector field. Okay, and, and, and this goes linearly in T. And then you, you can show this without, without uh, using the Fourier techniques. Um, in these papers, they even obtain quantitative decay estimates. Um, okay, but, but, but still you, you, need to, so, so you need this vector field and, you, and, and this is actually constructed also based on the angle action variables. So, so they, they use it to make this. Now, um, uh, if, I, if you remember what I said before, so if you want to have space-time observables, so you would integrate over P, but not over X necessarily. So for example, if I want the particle density, I would just integrate over P. So, so in this case, a test function would be distributional. So it will have a distribution support in the X variable. Uh, but actually you can also prove that the theorem still holds for these kind of test functions. Uh, the, the, the price to pay is that you need a little bit of more regularity. So in, instead of L1, you have to use a continuous, I mean, C1 with compact support or something like that. But that's, we, we have a shown how, how this works. So, so it turns out we can go to Fourier space and it's okay. And it, it's strong enough so they can apply all these steps. All right, so, so that's, so that's a, the theory you can apply once you have this action angle variable representation. And now what, what do you do with this? So uh, back to the Vlasov equation and Schwarzschild background. So, so can you apply the theorem? And the answer is no. The answer is no, because if you remember, omega three was zero. Okay, now if omega three is zero, then the Jacobian matrix, of course, will be degenerated. It will have a zero columns, so the determinant will be everywhere zero. Okay, and that's actually, I would expect it because of, of spherical symmetry. So, so you have, an additional constant of motion in this case, which is, so, so I just use LZ and L squared, but uh, the angle, I know the whole angular momentum is conserved. So the free components of the angular momentum is conserved. So, and, and it turns out actually that one of the, the, the Q var the Q free variables, which has zero frequency is actually the missing information that gives you this third information about the, the, 
Anglo momentum um, vector field that that's uh, the angular momentum vector that you 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 haven't used okay so the angular in, in other words the free pieces of the angular momentum that code it in l squared lz and in q3 and because q3 is conserved then it it, it wants it won't relax but you can still ask if there is mixing in the other two variables so, so you you still have omega one and omega two and if you remember those depend only on e and l so you can ask if there's two-dimensional mixing. So you repeat the same thing, just you in if you want, you put Q3 towards the J variables and you do the same thing with omega one and omega two. And then it turns out that this is the case. Uh, and you can write a nice condition for this, which is this, uh, uh, this uh, so introduce this area function. Okay, so this is the area under a curve of constant energy in the phase space of RPR. Which is given by by this integral r r one and r two are the turning points. And if you compute the Hessian of this matrix, then you can show that if the determinant of the Hessian is zero, different from zero, almost everywhere, then you will have mixing in the other two variables. Okay, so so the one-dimensional analog of this. You you wouldn't have the L dependency now. If you if you remember the the derivative of a with respect to E is the period function. So in this case, it just tells you that the period shouldn't be constant. Okay, now let me give you some, some, some examples. Uh, so some examples that you can find in, in Beanie and Tremaine's book uh, about, so, so there are actually some cases where you can compute this area function explicitly, which is which is nice to have. So, so one is what is called the Henault's isochron potential. So, uh, it has this parameter b, and you see if r is much larger than b, then it's like the the, the Newtonian potential, I mean minus one over r. But when r is very small, then this is constant, so it doesn't diverge uh, towards the center. And this has a very nice property is that, oh, well, of course, there are many functions with these properties, but this particular function has the, the property that the, the period um, the period of the, of the orbit is, is independent of L and given exactly by the same expression as the Kepler potential. So, so and that, that manifests itself here. So if you compute this area function, which you can do explicitly, there's one term that depends only on E, and then there's this term that depends on the angular momentum L. So, if you want the radial period, you, you would differentiate with respect to E, you get exactly the, the same expression as the Kepler expression. Okay, that doesn't mean the motion is, is the same because in the asymmetrical direction, you have a different frequency. And here you can actually see if B is zero, then this is just linear in L. And then when you compute the, the determinant is of the Hessian, this will give you zero. But if B is non-zero, then this, this nonlinearity implies that the, the terminal of the Hessian is different from zero. So you have mixing if B is larger than zero and no mixing in the Kepler case as expected. There's another nice toy model example. What you can do is you just take again the Newton potential or the Kepler, Kepler potential minus one over R. And then you add artificially to it a term A over two R squared. And now when you go to the effective potential, is just like changing L squared to L squared minus A2. So that means you can compute again from what you know from the Kepler problem, you can compute this, this, so this, so this area function has the same form as before, just now you replace L with L squared minus A2. And again, this introduced nonlinearity, which will introduce um, uh, mixing. And the, you can ask also this Navarro Frank White potential. Some colleagues of mine in Mexico, they did some numerical simulations uh, motivated by dark matter considerations. Uh, um, and, and, and then with uh, Paola, we, so they found some numerically, they found so some mixing. I'm going to show you a simulation in the next slides. But uh, with, with Paola, then we, we, I mean, we couldn't check analytically that this determining condition is different from zero. But at least we could compute it numerically, and it seems that at least in this range of parameters, the, this is satisfied. So these are simulations that they that they had done. So this is for for fixed angular momentum. So this is just R and PR, and they started with some initial configuration, and then they noticed if they evolved 
these are different snapshots at different times. And then they noticed that after some time, they settled down to some, what they called viralized states. And, and then we, we just looked at the inner just energy surfaces and, and then you, this is the initial state, this uh, black lines are the energy curves. So you, you can see what happens is that this is smeared out over, over the, the energy surfaces. So this is this angle average that they, they, they have. And then we compared the final configuration that we computed just from this initial one doing this angle average. And we compare this with the with the final state they had, and, and at least qualitatively, the, the matching was quite good. I mean, the, the numerical method probably had some dissipation in it, so that which meant that the amplitude was not quite matching, but but at least the, the uh, qualitatively it was very good. The, the comparison. Okay, another application that that we have done with uh, Paula some a few years ago is look at. Um, equatorial orbits in, in CAR. So bound, again, bound orbits, but confined to the equatorial plane of the CAR metric. So this is again a two-dimensional problem. And there you can also show that you have mixing if you have this uh, determinant condition. So, so now the area function has a little bit a more complicated structure because of the angular momentum parameter. But in principle, you can express this in terms of elliptic integrals. And then you can also compute this Hessian in principle, I mean, by symbolic calculations using Mathematica or something like this. And then you can check uh, if this determinant is, is zero or not. And it turns out uh, that it's, it, it seems to be everywhere, almost everywhere satisfied, but there is an interesting thing going on that, I mean, or that there's something that we found interesting is that there's, that, I mean, this is the, the space now. So we parameterize the orbits now, not in terms of E and L as before, but in terms of generalized semilatus rectum and eccentricity. So if you take the turning points, which are functions of E and L, and you pretend this was a Kepler problem, so you just associate this formula. So, so this maps our EL to R1, R2, and then e, R1 and R2 to P and E, okay? And, and, and now this is what is shown here. So you have P and E here. So the, this, the, the so every point here below this, this line represents a, an orbit, a bound orbit in, in the curve equatorial plane. And, and then there was a, a, there is a, it seems that there's a one dimensional curve where this is actually different from zero. Okay, close to the to the black hole, and then we don't know if that. I mean, we, we haven't found anything else in the literature so far that that. Um, I mean, people have studied resonances and things like that, but that that doesn't. It's not the same condition. So, so what we suspect then, and and uh, I mean, this is where more numerical work is is required here, is that to see well what what happens now if you are close to this region where the determinant condition is violated. So, so we suspect this would affect the decay rate. Um, there are some early indication. I mean, some, 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 uh, these are some things we have, we have done that uh, indicate that this could be possible. Um, uh, uh, also, Paula Rieseco in her recent work with the vector field methods, they actually were able to obtain decay rates and to show even including cases, I mean, these were one dimensional cases, but still there were cases where the determinant condition was not everywhere satisfied. So at some point it could be zero and there they could somehow get a bound, but which, uh, I mean, it's not clear if this bound is optimal or not, but at least what seems to happen is that uh, it is like a one over T decay with like a low uh, exponent, I mean, a low power. So one over T to the one third or one fourth, I can't remember it. Okay, so whereas if this is different from zero, then they will have one over T decay. Okay, so, so again, this is not a proof because this is just a bound, but, but that's certainly something that, that needs to be looked at uh, closer. Okay, because if the mixing, of course, is taking very, very long, then it could be that you have a structure there that survives for a very long time, and then maybe it is uh, relevant still. No. All right, so. Um, and then the conjecture is then uh, is that 
If you look at bound trajectories now in the full curve space time, uh, but the, I mean, this is a conjecture, we have no, no results at all. So it's, but, but the conjecture would be that, um, so um, if, you, if you take, for example, the world line of a stationary observer, okay, then, and then he observes the collisionless gas propagating on the car exterior, then he or she will see <clears throat> um, the configuration relax. So, so when, if, if uh, he or she measures observables, no space-time observables like like the current density or stress and stress energy momentum tensor, uh, will converge to to a distribution function that is obtained by averaging averaging out the angle variables. Okay, so in, in other words, this converges weakly to to this one. This sense. Okay, so if, if, if this is true, then this would be very nice because again, no, you, you don't have to consider these angle variables. You just re remain with these uh, action variables. Okay, and as I said, this has been demonstrated and restricted to the equatorial plane of Kerr or Schwarzschild. Uh, the time scale, so a lot of work is still needed to, to understand this. It depends on several aspects like the smoothness of the distribution function. The, I mean, because of this Fourier method, you, you can see in one place that, I mean, the smoother the function, the faster it will decay. Uh, but but it, it doesn't only depend on that. So it, it also depends on how well this determinant condition is satisfied and maybe also on, on and probably also on other things. Uh, okay, and, and, and future steps, I mean, once we have this, so, so what's, uh, it will be nice and to understand what happens in a self-gravitating case and or the case where you add an electromagnetic field to it. So then probably things get a lot less simpler. So if you have an electromagnetic field, for example, the instabilities are expected to happen and, and things like that. Okay, so that's it for the mixing. Now, now let me, before we break, um, just uh, show you four or five slides about the station axisymmetric tori we constructed so that this is very much inspired uh, by work that Ames, Andreas and Locke have been doing some, some time ago, uh, but, but they took in, into account the self-gravity, so it's not, so, so this is more sophisticated what they, what they have done, but, but in our case, we, we have the black hole and we assume that, the, again, that the self-gravity can be neglected. So the, the self-gravity is, I mean, the gravity is completely dominated by the black hole. So maybe it still makes sense to, to look at this. So, 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 so the, 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 what in, I mean, so, so we took from this, this, this polytropic ansatz. So, so the distribution function we know is a function of the action variables only, but um, uh, at, at, at the same time, um, so, so, so we assume here it doesn't depend on L, so just on E and LZ. Um, and, 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 and then for, for the dependence on E, we use this polytropic ansatz and also for LZ, uh, this ansatz. So, so here E0 and L0 are cut off parameters, okay? So, they, uh, so E has to be uh, smaller than E0, otherwise this is zero. And here the same LZ has to be larger than L0, otherwise this is zero. And then K and L here are some, some powers. Now for E0, and that's, uh, I think, different from what uh, they're doing in this work. So we are assuming this is the maximum allowed value to get rid of this parameter. So the configurations I'm going to describe here, they actually, the support is unbounded. So actually they, they go until very large radii. However, you can show that if you choose K larger than seven plus L half, you can show that this configuration has finite total mass and angular momentum. Okay, so, so they, they decay fast enough so that when you compute these quantities, it's, it's finite. And okay, in the parameter A here controls the amplitude of the distribution function and presumably this should be small enough so that our assumption of neglecting cell gravity is, uh, makes sense. Now you plug this into the current density and the stress energy tensor, and then you get complicated integrals, but you can perform all these integrals except the energy integral. So you can perform all integrals analytically. So all the ones with angular momentum, if you want, you can do analytically. 
However, the, the, there are some integrals over the energy, and this we, we have not been able to compute analytically, but still it's only one integral, so now it's easy to, to compute using Mathematica or Maple or something like that. Um, and, and now he, he, here you, you have functions of the energy that enter. So, so for example, this LCE, so, so I don't want to go into all the details, but LC of E is like the critical angular momentum, and that plays a very important role in all this business because basically so, so what this is is given some energy it will tell you what is the angular momentum that is such that the effective potential that the potential barrier is exactly has the same height as e or e squared okay so that means if the angular momentum is too small is below this critical value then the particle actually will have too much energy and will plunge into the black hole so you need the angular momentum to be at least this critical value so that it, it will encounter the, the potential barrier and be reflected and be trapped and not fall into the black hole. Okay. And in the Newtonian limit, you can actually compute this integral completely analytically. So you can com compute everything and you can write this in terms of hypergeometric functions. So that's nice because if this configuration have a very large, I mean, a very far from the black hole, then they should match the Newton limit. So here is a, an example with k is equal five and l equal one. And this cutoff angular momentum is 4m. Uh, so this is a cut in the xz plane. So, so this is axisymmetric, this contrary is axisymmetric. So it's a, um, <clears throat> it's a cut in the xz plane. And in these contours, they show you, and the colors, they show you, um, the particle density, how, how big the particle density is in, in some units. So, so you have a maximum here, and then, and as I said, this configuration, they go out to, to infinity, but, but decay is sufficiently fast. Uh, and, and uh, well, here I can show you another numerical example. So you have, uh, here you have also in some, so some, in some mass scale that I can't remember, I mean, suitably normalized. So this is the rest mass. Uh, as a function of this cutoff parameter. Okay, and now what, what I want to show you here is just that we, we, so we have these Newtonian models, which are the, the same thing as we showed you here, but where you, the potential is just the one over our potential in, in, the, in Newtonian theory. And, and then you have this, this uh, red curve and, and here the relativistic ones is this uh, black curve here. And you see if lambda zero is very large, they agree. And that you expect, of course, because if this cutoff parameter is very large, the inner rim of this configuration is, has a larger and larger radius. So, so in the limit when lambda zero is very large, you're in the Newtonian, I mean, you are very far from the gravitation radius. Uh, and another thing that you can analyze, you can compute the, the principal pressure. So you can compute the stress energy tensor. So from this, you can get out the principal pressures and, uh, and 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 this is this is a radius size, the dimensional radius, um, and and this is this shows you that the, well somehow the pressure anisotropy. So so p bar is the the mean pressure, and p one is the radial pressure, uh, p two the pressure in the polar direction if you want, and p three in the simultal direction. And you see that they may be very very different here. Uh, and as you go, as size is very large, so the, the, the polar pressure and the radial pressure, if you want, they, they, they agree with each other and the simultal pressure will be a little bit lower. So the pressure, remember that means, that measures basically the velocity dispersion. Okay, so, so that's, so because all the particles somehow rotate in the same direction, that's why somehow this asymmetrical pressure is not very large compared to the, the other ones. Um, and this, okay, and this we, from the Newtonian calculation, we get the same thing. So that gives us a lot of um, yes, confidence that this is, this is correct. All right, so maybe this is a good point to, to pause here because then we are going to switch the topic completely.